Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming here today. And um, we're really excited to introduce the data stores to everyone. Um, so to get started, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of background on why we built it. So if you look at everything the platform team has launched to date, it's all been files. And one of the things that we think is going to continue to be really important is files. Like We're going to continue to invest in files just because there's still all these photos, videos, and documents that are still in files. But kind of one of the advantages of being where we are is we got to see kind of all these developers kind of struggle with the same problem in different forms. Like all these developers were trying to solve this problem of like, how do I make my app work seamlessly between online and offline across different platforms? And you know, they, each one was asking for a different thing, but we thought that we could build a solution that would kind of solve all these problems at once. And this kind of hit home most most clearly when one of our engineers on their Android team came up to me when we were building this and said, like, hey, Brian, like, I'm really glad you're building this because we were going to add this feature to the Android app, but we realized we had a single bit of state we had to sync across devices. And that was like, enough to throw this project from like, a nice to have feature into like, an engineering like, huge investment. And it's kind of silly. Like, it's, it, it's, um, weird that we like are in this situation in the first place. Um, and I think there's like a couple reasons why something that like seems really simple, like, oh, I want to keep this one setting up to date across different platforms, can easily become like an engineering nightmare. Um, so th the first is, if you think about files, they're like very simple. Like one of the advantages of being able to build Dropbox is we have this very simple, like we have a, a list of bytes, we have a length of bytes, and we know how to sync that. Like that's, every developer knows what is in the file. Like they know it's a very clear contract between the developer and the user. And there's all this tooling around it, and everyone can understand what's going on. So the same thing we wanted to make hold true for data stores, which is you can actually understand the thing you're, you're dealing with and not make it a black box and kind of let you peer in to the thing you're actually writing to. So another second problem that like, the kind of post-PC era has forced everyone to become a sync expert. And one of the downsides of this is, or one of the things this kind of reminds me of, is before like, HTTP took off, to build an application, you had to start by defining a protocol and building a web server. And this was just a huge like, pain. You know, we have, we had, if you wanted to build a chat app, you'd have to build a chat protocol. And if you had to build uh, you know, a file uploading um, app, you had to invent FTP. But then HTTP came along and said, actually, you don't have to worry about framing or web servers or any of that. You could just actually build web services without having to understand how to build network protocols. So we wanted to build the same thing, but for sync, because we think it's just as important. And finally, when you add sync like, as an add-on, as a feature, once you've already kind of completed your app, it's almost too late. And the reason people do this is because it's really annoying to add. Like, you, it's a lot of work. You, you want to put it off like anything else that's not fun to deal with. You want to put it off as long as possible. So our kind of final challenge to solve was, how do we make this like, a pleasant enough experience that you'd want to do it from day one? And we thought a lot about like, what kind of tools can we offer to make syncing, instead of being this thing that's actually harder than normal developing normally, we could actually make it something that's easier, such as being able to peer into your data as your app is writing to it from your desktop. So that was kind of the motivation behind why we built it. And I want to introduce Guido von Rossum, the creator of Python and engineer of Dropbox, to introduce the Data Store API. Thank you, Brian. Hello, everyone. Hey, I got carded this afternoon. <laughs> <coughs> OK, how does this thing work? OK, so let me actually try to explain how to use the data store API, what a data store is. So the basic premise is that what you don't want to do is if you have a bit to, serialize, to synchronize between two devices, that you turn it into a sequence of JSON or XML and write it to a flat file because that is the stuff that does not give you conflict resolution. So instead, the Data Store API 
you do not actually serialize the data yourself. You pass the data onto the data store API by making calls into the API. This is why it's called an API. The data store API will then handle all the details for you. It will do three important things. When it's offline, it will cache all the data on the device so you have full access to the entire contents of your data store on the device, both querying and updates. Uh, when the device goes online, it will additionally upload the changes you've made while you're down offline or the changes you made at the moment you're online. It will upload those changes to the server at Dropbox. It will also download changes that were uploaded to Dropbox by different devices for the same user and the same app. And the most important thing, when it is uploading and downloading changes, it will also merge those changes and automatically resolve conflicts. And the reason that it can resolve conflicts is that you've given it enough information about your data and the structure of your data so that it can do that. <clears throat> so what exactly, how do, you, how do I want you to think about a data store? Well, a data store is just a place to store structured data. It's like a database. It really is more or less like a database. It has tables. The tables have records, fields, and values, and so on. But the important part is that it has an abstract API. The ver they're very sort of clear, simple to understand, high-level operations. You insert a record. You update the fields of a record. Of course, you can delete a record. And you can get stuff out, of course, either if you know the address the record ID of a record, you can get that record directly, or you can query by content. Now, it's not a relational database. You do not write SQL statements to access your data or to update your data. You make calls directly. Uh, it also, it doesn't have certain advanced features of relational databases like join queries. Uh, that is not the point of this data store. So, Okay, here is, here is a very simple basic picture of a data store. I don't have to explain this. You just have these levels where your data is structured. Your tables are for the purpose of querying and identifying records. Your records are the unit with which stuff is loaded into memory and written back. And the fields are the sort of the actual data that you deal with. So now let's suppose you have a very simple application and I'm not gonna use the uh, flipbook drawing application. I'm going to use a much simpler data model that you're probably familiar with. Let's say you have a contact database. Uh, so you have a contacts table. Every contacts table contains only two fields. Every record in the table only has two fields in this very simple example. There's a name field and an ad address field, and these are just free form strings. This is like the hello world of contact applications. And you have a phone number table, and the phone number there are multiple phone numbers per contact. And so one field is a label, one field is the actual phone number, and one field is a reference to the contact table, to a particular record in the contact table. And the easiest way to reference another record is just by storing its record ID, which is a long a random string, as a field in the phone number table. And that's really all I'm going to have to say about how you structure your data. You can sort of imagine from this example how to structure your application's data. Now, in order to use the data store, uh, there's a simple sequence of steps that you have to go through. The very first time that your app launches for a particular user, that user has to link the application with their Dropbox account. After the first time, they never have to think about that again because the uh, client library stores the access token and all that information. What you do have to do every time is, of course, you open your data store or you can open multiple data stores. We also provide you an API for opening the default data store for this app and this user. Once you have your data store open, uh, there are some method calls to open various tables. You if you have very simple data, you only have one table. The contacts example had two tables already. Once you have your tables open, uh, you can use the data. You can query, you can get data out of it, you can update records, uh, insert records, and so on. 
Now, whenever you want your changes actually to be persisted in the data store and in the Dropbox server and to make it to other devices if everything's online and connected, you call this magical operation sync. Now, sync is where it really gets interesting and where all the, the magic happens. And of course, sync is no longer really a four-letter word because it takes care of all this stuff for you. So until you call sync, your changes have just been cached in memory. Once you call sync, the, the client library, which is a pretty complex piece of software that we wrote for all the platforms we support, Android, iOS, and JavaScript, uh, more to come in the future probably. Uh, the client library takes care of all the magic. So it flushes your data to a local disk. It also sends your changes to an output queue which will be uploaded by a background thread. It never wait, waits for uploading or downloading to happen in real time. Sync just puts stuff in a queue and it fetches stuff out of, out of that queue. Uh, the sync is the only time that you will see the contents of your data store change. So if you make a query and you make, a, you make the same query again, you repeat the same query, you will get the same results unless in between you've called sync because sync may import other data into your data store. Now, the most important part and what I already mentioned is that sync takes care of conflict resolution between incoming and outgoing changes. And this is all uh, explained in the following diagram. So again, here's a model of your application. There is the eyeball representing the user and the screen representing a particular device. Underneath that is a pretty small box representing your application. And I can draw it as a small box because you only have to focus on the logic of your application. If you're taking notes, your application only has to worry about taking notes. It does not have to t worry about uh, all the syncing and networking I.O. and background threads and conflict resolution and all that. Uh, there is a gray line on the diagram representing everything that goes on in the client library. So your ap application makes changes and access data that is actually cached in memory. Uh, there's also an input and an output queue and a persistent representation of the state of your data store on your device's disk. And there are background threads that uh, whether or not your app is actually directly interacting with the data store will uh, be downloading changes or at least waiting for changes to be downloaded and uh, also uploading changes all in the background. And of course, when the device is offline, those threads are sleeping. So now you call sync, and a couple of steps happen. And uh, the first step is sync reads the input queue, and it reads the changes that you sort of queued up in memory. Uh, it merges them, and then it will write those changes back both to the local, data local snapshot of the data store as well as to the output, output queue. And so, this is where the conflict resolution happens. Now let's talk a bit more about exactly what is a conflict. Uh, except here is one diagram that you don't have to understand. This is all the logic that goes on given that, you have to, that we have to synchronize using multiple threads, incoming and outgoing changes. Uh, we take care of all this complexity so that you don't have to. So let's talk about conflicts and conflict resolution. I call it a conflict whenever two applications, uh, run, sorry, actually two instances of one application or running on different devices make changes to the same data store. Uh, it's really only a collision, something that, that sort of requires care in resolution uh, when those changes touch the same record. Uh, you can think of this as something that is very similar to what happened in Git or Mercurial or other distributed version control systems, except that Git and Mercurial, if you're really unlucky, if someone else changed the exact same line that you are changing, uh, will throw their hands up in the air and say, user, please resolve the conflict for us. We never, may, we never sort of give up like that. 
we have an algorithm that will resolve conflicts according to a prescribed set of rules that will always come, with, come up with a consistent solution. Now, sometimes an application has particular desires for how it wants certain types of conflicts resolved, and so we actually give you some options. I expect that in the future we'll eventually give you a callback, but currently the options are very simple. Uh, you basically have per table per field, you have a choice of five options. The default option is that the data that was already on the server for a particular field wins. Uh, if you don't like that, you can uh, change it to client wins, which means that the data, you, the update you just made on the device win. Now, in practice, you don't actually know when there are collisions who really made the change first because they're off, the devices were offline. So usually choosing the server, the, the data that was already persisted to the server by another device is the right idea. But this is up to the application's uh, choice in the end. So there are three more specialized rules. For primarily for numeric data, you can also say let the lowest or the highest value win. And this is also a very useful thing, for example, for timestamps. And finally, if it really is numeric data, either an integer or a floating point number, you can treat it as a counter or in the case of floats as an accumulator. And basically, all the changes you made are added up together to produce the final result of the conflict resolution for that particular field. So let's, let's walk through a few different examples of conflicts. Here's a very simple one. Uh, I'm using a, an even simpler example of a uh, data store, your, your classic employee uh, record that you find in uh, databases 101. Of course, it's up to you what you actually put in your data store. So let's say we have an employee database with three records and two devices both have a copy of that data, that data store, and they know that they have a copy of the same version of the data store. Now on one device, some record is inserted. On another device, another record is inserted. And so, how is this conflict resolved? Well, very simply, by merging uh, the two as if it were a set union operation. This is kind of, this is hardly conflict at all at all. So let's look at a slightly more complicated case. Uh, I have a wonderful desk number and a great ex phone extension at Dropbox, but people at Dropbox like to move their employees around a lot, so uh, uh, I get moved to desk 57, and someone else thought that my f extension wasn't actually a nice and easy to remember enough number, so they changed it. I actually thought that the old extension was easier to remember, but I guess that's just me. How does this get resolved? Well, because these actually affect different fields, even though they affect fields of the same record, it's actually not a conflict at all either. So the resolution is just, I moved to desk 57, and that's my extension. So now finally, let's suppose that there are two slightly miscoordinated office managers, and they have different ideas of where I'm gonna move. I get moved to desk 57. Oh no, I get moved to desk 68. What's gonna happen? In this case, and in this case only, the conflict resolution rules that I just listed are invoked. And let's say we have no particular specification for the desk field. Uh, then the first device that hits the server will actually win, and that happens to be device one. So I move to desk 57, just as well. So it could have been, I, I suppose we, we, we could have used different resolution orders here. Uh, we could have added the desk numbers, which would have made absolutely no sense. Or we could have used the, the one who hit the server last as the winner. Uh, in this case, I think it doesn't really matter because it's something that needs to be resolved eventually by the office managers. So let's look at a bit more what you store in your data store. So I mentioned there are fields. I didn't really show much about the values. It turns out a field value can actually either be a simple value like an integer or a floating point number. We have a few more timestamps, Unicode strings, binary strings. 
Uh, you can also have a list. You can have a list of values, and those values are simple values. We do not support lists of lists, because before you know it, you have turtles all the way down. Now, the list operations actually are the one area where we do a little bit of operational transformation. We support four native list operations, putting, uh, replacing a value, really inserting a new value, deleting a value, and moving, them, moving values around. And these operations, if different sequences of inserts and deletes and moves and puts are done on two different devices, the rules of operational transformation will tell us exactly how the resulting list will look. So there's, there's no loss of data, in a, in a sense. Uh, one final thing about lists is that you can actually also use a list as a tuple of values where you can uh, say, I have a Boolean and an integer and a string and maybe two more strings in my list. Uh, that's up to you. Uh, usually, you will, when you're actually using those insert and move operations, you're probably going to have a list of the all integers or all strings or something like that. Uh, one bit about record IDs. By default, when you insert a new record, you don't specify a record ID. The client library picks a record ID for you. It uses a strong random number generator that generates a very long random string. Well, it's, it's a little under 32 bytes, uh, which is guaranteed to be globally unique. Well, the, the guarantee is you'll get your money back, uh, but I don't think we have to pay out before the heat death of the universe. On the other hand, if your application wants to, to treat a particular table or the whole data store more as a key value store, you can also, as an application, you can make up your own record IDs. You can just say, insert a record, and it will have this ID. And for example, you could use the email address of a, an account if you think your email addresses are stable enough. Uh, this has some consequences for conflict resolution, because now if you have this, if, if records with the same ID are inserted on different devices, the, there's a conflict. And we're currently, we just resolve that as if it was an update. So all the same rules apply. To get your data out, uh, there are really two ways. You can retrieve a given record given its uh, record ID. And again, that works for the random record IDs as well as for the application-specified record IDs. And if there is no record, uh, no big deal, then we'll just give you a, a, an empty pointer that you can inspect so you know that the record didn't exist. On the other hand, you can... Uh, query for all the records in a table or specific records in a table given by the value of one or more fields. Uh, this is currently very simple. We check for exact equality, and the types also have to match, except we do some uh, uh, widening of integers to double precision numbers if necessary. So finally, and this is actually the last bit of detail uh, I want to mention, and if you, if you want to understand if you want to know how to code all this up, of course, just go to the developer website and follow our documentation for your favorite language. Uh, because we have three versions of this API with only very slight differences uh, for each language. Because, of course, the, the sort of the terminology, the conventions, the, the habits and idioms of different languages are slightly different. Uh, but what you actually find in all languages is this final feature, which is change notification, which means you can register a callback or a listener or an observer, depending on your favorite uh, language's terminology. Uh, basically, when something changes in your data store, or actually when something wants to be changed, when there is anything in the incoming queue, uh, your callback will be called so that you then can, as the application, you will have control over calling sync uh, to incorporate those changes and cause the merging of incoming and outgoing changes to happen. Uh, in order to assist in this process, if you, if you use your data store to display something on the screen, like, for example, uh, an animation or, or a picture or something like a list of contacts, uh, Sync will also return a data, store, data structure that tells you exactly what change, changed, which records in which tables changed, and whether they were inserted or deleted. Uh, 
caveat, in fact, uh, in JavaScript, the API, for somewhat historical reasons, is slightly different, and uh, you don't explicitly have to call sync, uh, but you can still register listeners that will be called when uh, your data store has been updated. So finally, to summarize, we have these data stores. Their structure is very familiar. You have tables and records and fields and values. The operations are very familiar. There is insert, there's update, there's delete, and there are queries, and there are some sort of field level update operations that uh, I'm not sort of documenting here in, in, in much detail. And then there's the magical sync operation that does these three things. When you call sync, or in JavaScript when sync is called for you at the end of uh, an event cycle, uh, your local changes, your inserts, updates, and deletes are persisted. Remote changes are incorporated. And finally, conflicts between local and remote changes are automatically resolved. And the resolution also always re results in more changes. Uh, finally, uh, there are callbacks so you can be notified when it's necessary to uh, update your display or to call sync. Now, because this is a beta launch, we have somewhat conservative limits on the size of the data that you could put in. Uh, we recommend that you plan your data stores to be smaller than 10 megabytes because the current version always caches the entire data store in the device. Uh, we recommend that you plan your records to be less than 64 kilobytes per record when serialized uh, using JSON actually is the current definition because the entire record is loaded in memory at various points, uh, both in the client and in the server. And finally, we support multiple data stores, but we do recommend that you don't go crazy and don't create more than 1,000, because you can tell the maximum size of the data store times the number of data stores you have. Uh, that's how much space you're taking up, both in the user's Dropbox account as well as on their device. Uh, we will be tuning performance and we will be tuning these limits to be uh, less burdensome, but actually I think they're already pretty liberal. So what are we releasing exactly? I already mentioned that there are three platforms that we're releasing today. There's Android, there's iOS. It works on iPhone as well as on iPad, of course, because it's just a library. Uh, and there's JavaScript, which works in modern browsers, I've been told, uh, Internet Explorer 9 and uh, better. And you know what that means. Uh, there's also a web console where, as a developer, you can inspect the contents of your data store without having to write any code. You can just sort of see, oh, I have these tables, and browse your tables. We are hoping to release more languages, more platforms. Uh, we recognize there is a, a need to access your data from uh, a server-side application that's not written in JavaScript. And we're also thinking about desktop applications. Finally, a different dimension, and personally I actually think this, this may be a more important dimension, is we're also going to open it up uh, for sharing. Uh, you will be able to share a data store just like you can share a folder or a file uh, from your Dropbox account. That is not yet a supported feature, but we, uh, we recognize that with sharing between users, this API is even more powerful than it already is currently. Uh, there's also, there are also ideas around sharing between applications, although you cannot really share between applications unless you have very good agreement on which schema to use. So finally, uh, I'm asking for your feedback. There is the Dropbox API development platform forum on the Dropbox website. If you go to the developer's site, uh, there is a link to the forum. And please let us know what you think. Let us know what your killer feature is. Uh, and with this, uh, I'll pass the clicker back to Brian, who has uh, one more summarizing slide, a uh, little discussion. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well, that is data stores. and. We obviously are really excited about it, and we think there's a lot of stuff to come. But for this release, we wanted to also kind of focus on what we thought were the most important things, which is just nailing working great offline, like always being able to work offline, but also 
being able to provide the advanced benefits of being online, such as being able to live debug your app. We also wanted to make sure our APIs are available across different platforms, so you don't have to learn a new API when you move to a different platform. You can build your mobile app first and then build a web experience when you need to, and you don't have to relearn everything, and all your data is already in data stores. And finally, like not having to think about conflicts, being able to get good default conflict resolution, and then as you develop your app, being able to like figure out how these things should be handled, but not forcing you to think about these things up front and you know, maybe never having to think about it. And so we're gonna spend the next few weeks kind of polishing up what we have, making sure it's super stable so that you can release apps to users that depends on this stuff. Because we, we wanna have the same experience that you get when you use the Dropbox uh, desktop client when you use the uh, Data Store API. So with that, uh, we'd like to open it up to QA. There's a uh, microphone stand right there, and um, we'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Go. Awesome. So when, when we store data ourselves on our own servers, we can process it later, access all the user's data at a later time to do server-side processing. Uh, is it possible with the data store API? Say I have 1,000 users uh, who connect with Dropbox, and I store data in their Dropbox account. Can I, from server-side, access the data of those 1,000 users store? So right now, our APIs are only on iOS, Android, and JavaScript. Uh, specifically for client-side JavaScript. So we don't, we are going to offer APIs for Python and other server-side languages in the future, but we don't have those today. Thank you. Um, are there any uh, plans to support more complex uh, comparisons with the filtering? So like, you know, greater than, less than, equal to, like that sort of stuff? Because I, I know this was only basic equivalents. I, I definitely have some plans for simple range queries and like, uh, value membership of sets, uh, nothing very fancy, uh, because we'll we'll have we'll have to process the queries out of the cache data, uh, but we can we can do a certain amount of indexing locally. So, uh, yeah, the the simplest queries that we currently offer are just the beginning. Thank you. Um, how, how does a user see this uh, data store? Can he delete it or can he look at it? Uh, what does it look like for the user? So right now, the user can see the data stores just from the developer's website, and we're still trying to figure out the exact way, but the idea is it is the user's stuff at the end of the day, um, and, they, and if they want to unlink, unlink the app and delete the data, they're able to. Thanks. Hey, uh, after linking uh, with the Dropbox account on an iOS app, like, say, iPhone version of an app, and then would it also be linked in the iPad version of the same app? Or would you have to link in both places? You still have to link uh, for each device to your app. Uh, the one thing we've built is you can, if you have the Dropbox app installed, uh, you only have to type in your credentials once. And then every time a user tries to link an app, it'll just flip to the Dropbox app. They just hit approve, and then it'll flip back. So they, don't ha they just have to press one button. Could you store the Dropbox token in the iCloud key value store and then, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> have it work across that universal right. apps on different uh, devices? Uh, we haven't looked into that. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm John. I've got two questions. Uh, for existing apps that use SQLite, is there an easy way to say, hey, just plug in the SQLite database and sync to the data store without doing anything? We, have, we haven't got something magical like that. Okay. Uh, it sounds like a, a cool thing to add. It's, it's something that a third party could actually easily write, something that reads SQLite uh, data and sort of translates it into call to the, calls to the data store API. That cool. should be pretty straightforward to migrate your data that way. Okay, cool. Uh, second question. Say I have uh, mm -hmm. 10,000 users on the app. Uh, would I be able to pull analytics from the data store from multiple users, or is it private for the user? As far as analytics, we're still looking at the best way to offer that to developers, but we definitely have plans in the, in the, in the works. Cool. Thank you. We, we understand that you want those analytics. <laughs> We have to just we have to balance it with the sort of the user's desire for for feeling that they own their own data and aren't necessarily spied upon. So there are two sides to that equation. 
if I'm building a JavaScript uh, web application and it's currently offline, and so I guess I'm still saving things to Dropbox, it's gonna cache it. If I close that web browser page and reopen it, is it gonna cache it on local storage on the browser? Uh, we don't have local storage caching at this time. So if the Java, if you're web, if you lose internet connection and you leave the browser open and you reload, it'll correctly send up all the changes you missed. But at this time, it won't cache those changes to local storage. Okay, so if someone closed the browser page, for example, you could lose those changes. At this time, yeah, we're we're working on fixing that. Okay. Guido and Brian, we have time for one final question. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Well. It, you're Very it. simple question. Any support of transactions with multiple tables and fields? Essentially, the data store sort of, it's a local data store, database. Uh, well, you said that you have contact table, phone tables, and reference between them. Uh, yeah. So the sync operation operates at the, the level of the whole database. So essentially, you can think of the time between consecutive sync calls as a transaction. OK, if I update contact, and then is it two separate calls? I no, you can, you can make changes both to your contacts table and to your phone numbers table, and then call sync, and it will synchronize both uh, sets of changes together. Well, what if update to contact success uh, was succeeded? No. the, the it, it, cannot partially succeed. Okay, the, so the, the tables are sort of all stored together as a single uh, object on the server. In, in a sense, actually, the, the tables don't really exist as objects. Mm -hmm. uh, you can think of it as a key value store where the key is just the tuple of the table ID and the record ID, and the value is a dictionary of the field uh, names and values. Okay. Thank you. I think that's all the time we have. So uh, it was great to be able to present this to you today. And if you want to find out more, we'll be at the help desk um, uh, in the lobby. Thank you.